uh, we finished last uh, week talking about the properties and of uh, solids and I finished with the with a phase diagram for uh, some substance which we think we are very familiar with namely with the common ice and uh, I am showing that phase diagram again as you see there are many many different kinds of ice which are present and I'm showing this diagram in order to focus your attention on the fact what are actually the most important differences between the liquids and the solids. And let's think about the liquids. Uh, if, we, uh, if we have a container with a water, liquid argon, a benzene or whatever, then the important macroscopic properties of those substances like that a particle out of which can are they are built they can flow move from one point to another and if those particles are exchanged or moved uh, macroscopic properties of a system are uh, in some sense the same uh, the other important properties are that if I have a huge container full of the liquid, then all the points within that container are equivalent. What does that mean? That means that if I'm having a huge container like an ocean, and if I put my finger in one particular point and I move it two kilometers away, then there are no macroscopic differences between that water. And the final uh, property, which is important for uh, my talk, at least for that part of the lecture, is that in the liquid there are no privileged directions. Those three properties, in some sense, define a macroscopic substance which is we call liquid and uh, sure in nature there are many substances which are commonly called liquid but which will not uh, actually fulfill all those three conditions for example if you are watching me on your computer screen uh, there is a certain probability that you are watching me on a liquid crystal display and that liquid crystal display does is a liquid crystals uh, substances discovered at the turn of a 20th and 12th, 20th century they uh, are uh, in sense both liquids and solids they flow but they have a privileged directions and not all the points in the liquid crystal are equivalent. So let's look at the solids. The solids are substances where the constituent particles sit on a given points in the space. In most of the cases, that structure which arrange those positions in which the particles sit are uh, one of the crystallographic lattices. So the position of the particles are uh, well defined and the particles do not move away from them. If they execute a motion, they move on the, in the neighborhood of the, of the particular site. Uh, the other property which distinguishes solid from the liquid is that the different points in the unit cell, and I will shall define the unit cell in a second, are not equivalent. If the solid is built up as one of the permitted by, by the mathematics lattice cells in a three dimensional space, then it, they not necessarily look 
like the simple drawing on the page of your high school problem book, namely the square or cubic lattices in three dimensions. They might have a different geometry, and the geometry is occasionally so complicated that at different points within the given that, 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 this, that this lattice consists actually of a fragments, and those fragments have a complicated geometry, and those fragments repeat themselves in the space. Those elementary fragments, which then repeat in the space, we call a, a unit cell. And uh, it is a mathematical uh, exercise to prove that if I know all the geometrical properties of those unit cells, and if those unit cells repeat themselves, filling up the whole space, then the properties of that particular unit cell repeats itself if I cut a larger volume of the lattice and so forth. And um, the points within the unit cell are not necessarily equivalent. There is a, a full science of, uh, of a lattice structure which deals with the consequences of the fact that the unit cells can have a complicated geometry. And the consequences of those geometrical intricacies of the unit cells are responsible for many macroscopic properties of a crystals. For example, they are responsible for the properties of the semiconductors, which are used, uh, which are the heart of the contemporary uh, electronics. So in a certain sense, without the knowledge of that fact, we wouldn't be able to build up contemporary devices like uh, transistors and there's just no way how we can imagine the life nowadays without the transistors or the other electronic devices like the those solid state memory devices which sits into the pen drives and so and also the underlying structure of your screen on which you are watching this lecture and the third difference between liquid and solids to keep with the number of those three properties are is that there are privileged directions in the crystals if you have a cubic crystals that's very easy to see that there's uh, each of the directions along the edges of a cube are equivalent but if you have a hexagonal crystal then those two directions which are in a hexagonal plane are different from that axis along the, which is perpendicular or at angle to them, the Z axis that we used to, we used to, we used to say. And that non-equivalency of, of the directions in the crystalline lattice play also tremendously uh, important role in the, in the physics phenomena which occur in the crystals. If you, if you look at the magnetic materials, those materials which do have the magnetic properties, then most of them uh, is related to the fact that the magnetic ions sit on a, on a certain axis in a crystal and uh, not on the others. So for example, uh, many magnetic crystals looks like the arrays, the bundles of one-dimensional lines along the magnetically active ions are located. And each of these lines to certain extent and uh, for magnetic properties to most of the, prop the facts behaves as a one-dimensional object. So we have those three differences. And let's ask us now the question, what is the 
main reason of those differences. What physical property is actually responsible for the differences between liquids and solid as shown on this uh, little table. And uh, what distinguishes these three different this, this states of matter? And the answer is there is a one property and that is a property which we call a symmetry. And we have started our lecture, as you remember, with the discussion that there is a difference between the symmetries in the uh, or, organic life and the non-organic life. And we discussed the, uh, the, the symmetry a little bit. And uh, I would like to spend some time today discussing the symmetry consequences in distinguishing between liquids and the solids. And the, that brings us to the part of our uh, talks on uh, crystal properties or solid properties, which has a traditional name, elasticity. That is a science which is extremely important when, and which in some sense grow up as an independent branch of science, similarly to hydrodynamics. And because that is the, that is the part of our physics, which is responsible for the fact that we can build devices, that we can build houses, well, whatever, because when we construct something from a material, we have to be able to estimate how sturdy it will be on depending on what kind of interaction that structure will be supposed to survive in its life. So, Let's start with discussing a, a very simple system. Namely, imagine we have a one dimension solid. We have the particles, atoms, or molecules, which I have denoted as a, as a well, what the hell is this color green? Or, well, it doesn't look like very green on my screen. Anyway, those little dots, and they sit at a certain position, the lattice side which are labeled by a position x along the x-axis. So if I look at these two, two particles, that one sits on a position x1, and that sits on the position x2. But the lattice is, uh, the, this, this particle which formed the lattice must have some kind of interaction between each other, because if they didn't have the interaction, then there will be no reason that they keep exactly certain distance from each other. Like we are now asked to spend, to stay two meters, at least one half, one and a half meter or two meters from each other in this social distancing procedure imposed by the pandemia regulations. Like there must be some rule which keeps this green atoms par or particles or molecules at a certain distance from each other. And I have depicted those rules which keep them away by a spring. For what are those particles? We know that they interact. And when they interact with the, you recall, the Van der Waals potential, then basically, if I have two of such a particles, they will sit, sit with respect to each other at the distance which roughly corresponds to the minimum of the Van der Waals potential. So, if, so what happens now if I apply a force, if I push one of those green particles by a certain external force? Well, if I push them, then those fictitious springs, which keep the arrangements of our uh, particles, they will be under, a, a, they will also suffer a certain force applied to them. So they will, as a result of that, those green particles will move away from that 
from their position x1, x2, and so forth. And I shall call those position equilibrium position of the particles. So when they move away, situation will now look like this. Our particles will still in the one dimension and they will move a little bit. So the part, that particle, for example, a particle number one, has moved a little bit from position x1 and that means that its new position will be x1 plus certain deviation from the equilibrium position which I have denoted as a little u. So uh, I have put up a restriction on my positions, namely such that the difference between the x2 and x1 is equal to a, between x3 and x2 is equal to L, also to a, and so forth and so forth. And I shall call that length a a lattice constant. And in one dimension, there is no other symmetry element than the lattice constants. It tells me that the atoms are forming a periodic structure and the periodicity of that structure is having a length a. So that is very easy to calculate that the total length of that one dimension structure denoted as L sub zero is just the number of lattice sites times the length. And uh, that is the structure. And uh, in the 17th century, there was a physicist, British physicist, Robert Hooke, a con contemporary to Isaac Newton, who had concluded that if the force applied to our lattice is not too strong, then the particles move away from the equilibrium positions, but not too much. And if they move not too much, then the difference between the old and new position of the particles will be just proportional to that displacement which I have denoted by a little u. So the relation between the force and the displacement will be linear. There will be coefficient which converts the unit of u into units of force. Force is measured in newtons. U is measured in meters, so that this coefficient k is just the newtons divided by meters, and that law is called the Hooke law. Uh, Robert Hooke was actually an interesting individual. He was uh, a secretary of a royal society and keeps, was very busy with preparing the experiments for the royal society for he was basically a poor man. And uh, uh, he also is, as historians are trying to tell us, was the first individual who guessed what is now called the Newton law of gravity. But that's the, that's the other story. So that is a hook law, which says that the displacement is proportional to the force. All right, so let's look at the situation again. We have our green points connected with the springs and we apply a force and we displace, but we can displace those particles, not only applying a force such that the displacement is identical. We can apply the force such that the first atom moves a fraction of a centimeter, a second move a fraction of a millimeter, but in the opposite direction, a third uh, half of a centimeter, yet again in the other direction. And also, the force might be a time dependent. 
So the displacement of the atoms can be not only the function of a position, but also a function of time. I put a little arrow on top of this U, for I am assuming that uh, what I write here might in some sense be generalized to more dimensions. And as we see then, we cannot use only a scalar variables to describe displacement because we have to answer the question, if the applied force acts in the x direction, what it might be the displacement of an atom in a crystalline lattice in the z direction? So we must use the vectors, objects of a geometrical structure. So that is just to remind you about that complication. So I have depicted the displacement as a little arrows. And uh, my hook law is now quite a simple. A force is proportional to the displacement. If I will put up this law into the Newton equations, which describe the dynamics of the lattice, which is a linear equation, but a fairly complicated because uh, atom X1 is connected to atom X2, and atom X2 to X3, and so forth, and so forth. So I will have a complicated linear equation to solve, and that is possible. So if the force is periodic in time and space, I can solve my Newton equations exactly, and the solution is that the displacement as a function of position and time is a simple trigonometric function, is a simple cosine function with some coefficient. There are two coefficients in the brackets, which one is the wavelength, denoted as a lambda, and the other is a velocity, VL. That coefficient here tells us what is the special extent of the lattice deformation described by displacement, and this coefficient denoted as a v with sub index lambda, tell us what is the velocity with which this excitation moves along the crystalline lamp. It turns out that this velocity is equal, uh, uh, is, is, is just lambda, uh, uh, is inversely proportional to the wavelength, and in the numerator, we have a ratio of the constants k, k, this hook constants from the force displacement relation, and the rho is a density of the particles along the axis, x. So I have everything here, and the important thing is that in the first term in the bracket, and also in the second, the lambda sits in the denominator. So we, if, we have, if we have excited the excitations in the lattice described by that equation, then the lattice is very asymmetric. There is no symmetry in it. When we move we, we, by a, a a distance a, the lattice constants, we do not come back to the same structure of a lattice, and the things are pretty disordered. But what happens when the wavelength of the excitation, a parameter lambda, goes to infinity? When lambda goes to infinity, then the, the expression in the bracket vanishes, and when it vanishes, a cosine is equal to zero, uh, the argument of a cosine is equal to zero, so the cosine of zero is equal to one, so we get the expression that in a lambda going to infinity limit, the displacement is equal, becomes constant. When it becomes constant, that it corresponds to motion, to the translation of a whole lattice, by a distance u zero. 
nothing changed because we have shifted the whole thing by the distance u zero. So we cannot tell what is the structure now in the, the structure now doesn't change anymore. It, we shifted the whole thing. So we have restored a translation symmetry of that lattice. And the situation can be uh, this kind of a situation where one of the possible motion of the lattice at the wavelength going to infinity restores a symmetry which is broken by the lattice itself is in physics called the Goldstone mode. And that is the extremely important, uh, one of the most fundamental concepts in the elementary particle physics, uh, which can be visualized so simply for uh, a, a simple one dimensional lattice. What is then this distortion of the, of the, uh, of the symmetry? Now you see the picture of the broken translation symmetry. That line is completely broken. It's no longer translation. Even if the line had been painted from Warsaw to Krakow, then because of the little hump, because somebody avoided painting that piece of wood, is breaking the symmetry. But if the painter made that bump U with infinite wavelength, that bump will be extending by itself from Krakow to Warsaw, and the translation symmetry of that one dimension system will be completely regained. So we had managed to learn a little bit of a complicated physics and uh, we will we shall continue with the elasticity further on let's we have a the same picture again okay and the reason why i'm showing it again is that since i apply a force the particle move so that force does some work and if that force does some work then it creates it stores the energy in our lattice one dimension lattice so if i have a displacement u then it is an exercise in elementary calculation to show that the total energy of that lattice of that displacement is one half of a coefficient k times u squared. And that is a very important relation, so kindly keep it in mind, because we will use it in a second for uh, a, 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 an exercise from the biology. Uh, I, I, I'm, I, I'm aiming at uh, calculating for you uh, what is the maximum height from which we can jump uh, without breaking our legs. All right. Uh, if I apply that force, then the length of the lattice, remember L0 was just the number of sides times the lattice constant, changes by a little delta U, and that little delta U, the delta L, and that delta L is essentially nothing else than the sum of all the displacement of the particular points. All right. So let's now leave the one dimension world. We are not really living in a one dimension world. So let's look at the situation in a three dimensions. And let me first look at the, uh, on the cylinder which to which I have applied a force which pulls it in both directions. If I do it, then the length of the cylinder changes by a delta L. And if I do the opposite, namely if I press the cylinder with the force from a top or from the bottom, then the cylinder shortens a little bit by a delta L. 
if the materials out of which the surrender is made is subject to the hook law, then this is easy to imagine that there must be a similar to our lattice relation between the change of length delta L and the force which is applied to it. And uh, in a three dimension, in a three dimension world, the physicists and engineers try to use uh, not a dimensional number delta L because it has a dimension, but the dimension less change of length, namely the delta L divided by L zero. And that kind of a quantity has its own name in physics. It's called strain and is conventionally denoted as a little epsilon. And similarly, if I have a cylinder, not the one dimensional uh, lattice, then as we remember from our talk about the liquids and solid uh, and gas, the force applied to the area here is uh, divided by that area is just what we used to call the pressure. And in the elasticity theory, an analog of a pressure that force divided by the area of my sample is called stress. And the hook law uh, defines a coefficient which previously I labeled by K, but in elasticity theory is usually called the capital E or a capital Y. It's called the Young modulus. And it is a simply the relation between a stress and strain. So we have to divide this, we have to divide these two quantities by each other to get the modulus. And out of that comes a simple redefinition of a hook law that the stress is linearly proportional to the strain. This is a stress strain relation. And if I plot that relation on a plane where the x-axis is just the strain and the y-axis is stress, then I have a set of a straight lines. And I have plotted here the hook law for various substances. For example, for a, as you see, the Young modulus uh, well, because it has the same, it has the dimension of Pascal's, so it's measured in Pascal's. The biological tissues have a young or, or modulus, which is 10 to the fifth of a Pascal. The common rubber has, which is easy to check by yourself that the hook close is really true. Is, uh, ten, is slightly larger, 10 times larger. The plastic materials, like the bottles, like that material out of which the mineral water bottles are made, uh, is 10 to the ninth of the Pascal. And the construction material of the our civilized world, namely the steel, has a coefficient 10 to the 11. So it's six order of magnitude stronger in that sense than uh, biological tissue. But what is happening when we will uh, deform the body if the strain, strain becomes larger and larger? Is this low holding up to infinitum? No. If we will extend the strain, then the, re then the relation between stress and strain becomes much more complicated. And this is roughly the drawing of what is happening. Initially, we still have a hook low, a straight line. And then eventually, at a certain value of a strain, or if you want at a certain value of a stress, this something is happening and the 
curve becomes essentially flat. That point is called the yield stress. The substance uh, uh, is deforming without actually or a very little applied stress. There must be something what is happening inside of the materials that when the stress is sufficiently high, something in a quotation breaks in. The question is that the, that the materials microscopically consist of this lattice point sitting in a geometrical structure. And geometrical structures cannot just simply break, disintegrate. They, in some sense, disintegrate when we apply too much temperature and if the crystal melts. But if we just apply the force, they do not disappear. There's something which is must happening within the geometry. And that point was not well understood until the beginning of the 1920th century when uh, people have found out that the crystalline lattice may undergo a certain peculiar transformations which uh, breaks the geometrical or in a more precise language topological structure of the of the crystalline lattice topology is that structure of a geometry which is independent of a deformation so the topology is being brain and there was a great italian mathematician vito volterra and you remember we were be talking we were talking about the uh, vito volterra on our short uh, discussion of a uh, population dynamics when we were talking about the uh, van der Waals, the, uh, when we were talking about the logistic map and chaos and Vito Volterra was uh, had proposed what is happening in a crystalline lattice at that particular point and in, invented together with the Dutch physicist Burgers a uh, concept of a dislocation, that there is a geometrical change in a crystal which facilitates that particular stress strain relation. And when we keep going with applying higher stresses or larger deformations, then the stress strain relations start to become like this. It looks like that all over the sudden the material becomes stronger again. And this is a called a straight strain hardening, which harden to some certain material, but the relation between the stress and strain in real materials stops to behave like this. And uh, that is the what the engineers are afraid of when they are building, uh, for example, a steel construction on which the buildings are hauled. And uh, one of the dramatic consequences of this seemingly increased strain, which leads to the, another phenomenon, which is called the necking, that is that, that the material becomes thinner in the middle. We apply the stress, and it's not on the extended length, but also becomes thinner. And, uh, in the perpendicular to the force direction. And that was what had happened to the skeleton, metal steel skeleton of two towers in New York, when under the tremendous amount of uh, localized energy, uh, the lattice on a certain part of the building, the steel lattice in the certain part of the building, underwent the, this deformation as shown on the drawing, and eventually there is a point which is called the fracture. The construction had collapsed. So this is basically extension of a hook law, and uh, engineers are pretty good nowadays in uh, 
having a laboratory measured properties of a given construction materials, construct a, a construction like a building, a bridge or whatever, which can uh, operate at the, under the weight and not only the weight of the say trains or people walking on it, but also by a blowing wind or falling snow and things like this. And they can, can, they can use this particular property to proceed with our construction. This is very tricky if you think that uh, these giant buildings nowadays constructed, they have inside a metal construction and a concrete construction. So they have a metals and a ceramic material, kind of a material. And on the site, they have a glass plate. And they had to keep those glass plates with the same kind of elastic properties so that the building, when they move shapes and so forth, will not shed the skin, so to say, shed the glass cover. And that would be incredible disaster. So we, 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 we know a little bit about the stress strain relation and uh, just a few names. If I pulled up the cylinder, the, the deformation is called tensile. And when I apply the force, trying to shorten it, then it's a compression. But now let's look at the not of the cylinder and let's let, at, at last, at, let us look at the, at, at, the, at the block of a material in the form of a cube. If we look at this cubic material uh, and we apply the force F in, the, in this direction, which I still keep going, keep calling X. And let me hold the, the bottom of the box hold or apply the same force F in the opposite direction. Then this is what the engineer will call shear and the upper layer of the material will move away and that will be held fast. So now we have a complicated situation. The length of the cube was L0 now there is an increase of that direction delta L, but there is a different change of the length of the, what was previously vertical edge. And we have a complicated situation for we apply a force in one direction, but the deformation might happen in the other direction. And since we have three dimensions, we, we might envisage a situation where we apply the force in one direction and we have to, and we may have a reaction of the materials in all remaining three directions. That means that the deformation cannot, and the strain cannot any longer be just a number because that number can only tell me what is happening in one direction. But I have to be I'm able to answer what happens with the lengths in the vertical direction to the direction of applied force. And that means that we have to use a special mathematical description to do this. And I'm not going to deal with this more. I will just write you that, for example, we can have a stress in the direction X and X, and the direction X and Y, and the direction X and Z, and it will cause the change, the strain in the direction X, X and Y, and two perpendicular directions. And you, I can write many, many of them. Since there is at most nine, of those different stresses in three-dimensional world, and nine strains in three-dimensional world, 
that the most general Hooke's laws which I can write is a relation, the little i and j stands for x and y, so is k and l, and the relation of that object with the nine, nine numbers sigma to the nine numbers epsilon is related by a giant table of the numbers which generalize the Young models. And the property of the giant table depends on the microscopic properties of the crystal, of the lattice, of the material. And if this is a homogeneous and completely isotropic material, then we can prove mathematically that there are only two independent E coefficients. This giant, three times three times three, that means uh, nine times three, 27 times three, there's a 60 and 80, 81 numbers. Uh, in general, they reduce to these two numbers, which are called Lame coefficients, lambda and mu. Lame was a French mathematician who was one of the first who had used the complicated geometrical language and methods to describe, to solve the differential equation of elasticity. And these two of coefficients, they have to fulfill certain conditions. The coefficients mu, which is called the shear coefficient, must be always larger than zero, but remarkably, the symmetry conditions do not tell us what is the sign of a coefficient lambda. It can be negative or as positive. But it just so happened that there are essentially no materials for which coefficients lambda is negative. There are coefficients, peculiar coefficients with the negative lambda, but I'm not going to discuss it why that so happened. And um, if we will try to describe the isotropic homogeneous medium with, without this complicated relation, then we can calculate what will be the change of the volume of the material under the pressure and that coefficient which tells us that change is called, again, Young modulus. And it is, it is given as a sum of lambda plus two thirds of the mu. So that's the hook law in the three dimension. And then the energy stored in compressed or stretched isotropic body is very similar to what we had for the hook law for our lattice. It's proportion to the square of this elongation or compression. And what replaces the length, the, the, the spring constants k, is the product of the Young modulus times the area of the sample divided by its length. All right. So now we have the application of, from biology. Namely, we are going to talk about the bond fracture. This is just an example why I bother you with all those complicated engineering uh, concepts. And uh, let, uh, we have our leg bone, and let's assume that it has a length L, and the cross section is equal to A. This is approximate uh, description of a bone, but let's, let's use it. And uh, for a, but for a average individual, that cross section is a six centimeter square, and the length of the L zero is about the, about slightly less than one meter, and that's for the seventy kilograms person. So let's use our knowledge of elasticity to calculate a few things. I really remind you the stress strain relation. Stress strain relation is that ratio. So now I can assume I know the stress at which the bone breaks. Then the force at which it will break is out of the stress relation given by the following 
expression. If I now do a little bit of algebra, then the change of the length of the bone is uh, that given by nature value of a stress at which the bone cracks times its length divided by the young model. So the energy which is stored in the in my bone when the stress is applied to it turns out to be very simple and it is uh, the area length that is what that's the volume of the bone divided by the young modulus and times a square of the of the stress at which the bone cracks so now i have to take the wikipedia or any book on which will con which has these numbers and it turns out that the stress at which the human bones actually most of the animal bones breaks is the 10 to the power 8 of a newtons by the meter square and that is of course 10 to the 8 of the pascals and the young modulus measured for the leg bones is 14 times 10 to the 17 newtons per meter square pascals so i can plug these numbers in and having the knowledge that the cross section is six centimeters long this point meter so i have all the coefficients here so i can calculate that energy and that energy is 192 point half of a joule uh, in the leg we if we jump we have two bones because we land on two legs therefore i have to multiply that by a factor of two and i'm sorry and the energy which is stored in the leg of a person with the weight of of the order of 70 kilograms jumping uh, is then twice the 192 joules so that is the if i divided that by the mass of the 70 kilograms and the gravitation constant g gravity gravitation acceleration g then i calculate the height from which i have to jump in order to store so much of the energy in the bone so it turns out that if i jump from the height of a 56 centimeters 60 centimeters then the my bone will crack and everyone of now knows that we can easily jump from the higher much higher heights without breaking our legs why that so happen it so happen because we never apply a whole energy to the bone by changing our body we are jumping out from the height and then we change the shape of our body we kneel or we turn and that means that we dissipate part of that energy without applying it to our bones but that is basically the limit from which our bones can stand if we do not anything and that explain why so often we break our legs by simply falling on the ice because if we so when we fall off uh, without any precautions taken on the on the ice we do not change the shape of our body on falling and that is roughly what is then uh, what is then uh, what is actually what is actually happening so uh, that was a short exercise of application of elasticity theory to the biology and then we will and now we are going to go into a, another part of physics which plays important role in biology namely to thermodynamics what you see on the, that picture is a heat engine steam engine and uh, 
that is in fact true that the science about the heat and thermodynamic science how the how the heat energy is being converted into work the other way around and what are the consequences was the a science which originated with uh, when the people built the steam engines and uh, the, there is a story who had built the first uh, steam engine as always there are stories that ancient greeks have the something which looks like it's called heron mill and things like this but basically the first steam engines have come out into existence in england uh, when the uh, when the british have chopped off uh, all woods in the woods and they didn't have much of the woods left for burning and heating up the houses so they had to dig out coal and they start building the coal mine and one of the problems they encountered in coal mines was not so much lifting up the coal up from the from the pit but basically what to do with the water because the mine underneath is is if left without any action taken is flooded in a question of hours so the main problem in the mine is to get rid of the water and of, of course also to get rid of the gas of the methane which is there but that's not the part of the thermodynamic and anyway the so the engineers were building complicated devices to pump the water out of the mines and eventually they came out with the steam engine and uh, usually the history tells that the first really usable steam engine was built by, by James Watt and James Watt constructed the, the, uh, the, the, the engine. But I'm not going to talk about the steam engines, I'm going to talk about the science of thermodynamics and this is the only branch of physics where, where uh, the fundamental law of nature, the law of conservation of energy, we owe to the medicine. Uh, the history, in some sense, our, we are now, uh, uh, in a sense, what we are doing now giving to the biologists and the medicine people the all those fantastic devices uh use in the in the diagnosis um, from the stethoscope through the x-rays uh computerized tomography nuclear magnetic resonance ultrasonography and now position posit, positron emission tomography pad and finally if we will master it single photon emission tomography uh, this is just uh, uh, that we are paying a tribute to the medicine for formulating for us the fundamental law of physics and fundamental law of nature the law of the conservation of an energy and the law of conservation of energy is in uh, thermodynamics called the first law of thermodynamics and actually has been formulated first time and in a proper sense, proper way by Julius Robert von Meyer, a German ship doctor who uh, on one of his trips over the equator was reading, I, I believe the ship was called Java, but I'm not sure I remember it correct. I might check for the next week. And uh, Rob Meyer was uh, reading a, a book by a French chemist and physicist, Lavoisier. Lavoisier, as you might know it from a course of chemistry, was the man who, in, who, 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 who understood what is the burning. Right, that what is the rule of the oxygen uh, 
in the process of burning. And he had stipulated that actually they, uh, when we, that the animals and the humans, when they consume the food, that the process of getting the energy out of the food by the living creatures is nothing else as the burning of something. So uh, uh, Meyer was reading the book by Lavoisier and realized that if that would be the case, then the concentration of the oxygen in the human blood should change. And he had a proof of that in the fact that the blood in our ven venous blood is much red as compared to the arterial blood in humans. And he realized that when he was crossing the equator, some of his soldiers got sick and he had to restore to this famous, uh, at the time, method of treating a fever, namely by bleeding the patients. That is, uh, that is uh, from the field book of Wand Medicine of Hans von Gersdorf from 16th century, showing the points on which you can bleed the patient. So let's now go back to the, the mayor. And he was bleeding patients and realize that the color of a blood was changing when they were crossing the equator. Once they were in a warmer climate, the color of a blood was changing and that implied that the content of oxygen in a blood was changing. And that, what, what Meyer concluded was that uh, in the warmer climate, you do not need to eat so much. Therefore, you are burning less oxygen than in the colder climate. And therefore, uh, he can concluded that the, there is a conservation law of what we wrongly called a force. And until the pretty late in the 19th century, what we nowadays call energy, physicists were actually called force and they use a different forces. There was a vital force and that force, other force. That's the energy. And when he came back from his trip, he wrote the paper. That paper was not accepted. And Meyer was fighting for his achievement. And that ended up very badly. He, had, he, he, he tried to commit a suicide and that was unsuccessful and he suffered a lot and he was eventually closed in the mental asylum and he died actually in the mental asylum. And his work and the fact that he had formulated the law of a conservation of energy for the first time before the British scientist and the brewer owner, Jules, has done and Jules was for years considered to be the father of a law of conservation of energy, but that's not true. The father of a concentration energy, uh, of the conservation of energy was, uh, was Robert, Julius Robert Meyer. And he died in 78, a completely unknown person, and he formulated the law of a conservation of energy. And now we are going to talk a little bit about that and about it. The, what is on this drawing is a, is a post stamp issued by a, a, a German post to commemorate his 100 years of uh, death in eight, 1978. It, it, it was a 90 groschen at that time, Phoenix at that time. Uh, uh, they didn't have euro at the time, so that is the that is this uh, the stamp. All right. So we are now going to talk about the conservation of energy, and let's imagine for a for a second that we have a container which contains a piece of matter. Uh, we, as usually, we can have two views of it. We can look at it as a macroscopic body, or we can 
describe even the macroscopic properties of that system by our knowledge of a microscopic property. And uh, quite remarkably, when thermodynamics developed, uh, people had very little knowledge of what, what is actually inside, <laughs> how is the internal structure of the materials. The concept of atoms was, of course, hanging around since the time of ancient Greeks, but uh, I, I gave you an example of a Gassendi that he used to think about the atoms, atoms as being different atoms for heat and cold and so forth. So that microscopic story was very vaguely understood, to say the least. But the macroscopic physics was pretty well understood. And um, people uh, had developed most of the thermodynamics on a phenomenological level. And it turns out that actually those laws of thermodynamics, which we now understand on the basis of a microscopic physics very well, they have been first derived from a macroscopic observations and with the use of a very deep logical thinking and analysis. It is particularly true as related to the second law of thermodynamics, which will be the subject of our talk next week. But the, because it's, we have to devote all, mostly, mo, probably all the lecture to the second law, because it's the fundamental, in some sense, law for biology. And the, uh, uh, the, the second law is now, of course, understood and discussed in a completely different way than it was 70 years ago. But still, when I was a student at the university, what we were being taught was a phenomenological thermodynamic. And we were learning the first, the second law of thermodynamics without any relation to the microscopic structure. And particularly, and I now use for the first time the word, without the probabilistic aspects of it. But we have a piece of matter and it consists of a particle. So let's concentrate on what those particles out of which the body are, are doing. Well, we, we already were discussing that in the liquid and the gas case, they are moving. So I described that they have the, that they are moving, so they have a kinetic energy a relation to the velocity, which I have denoted as a red arrow. And they move, of course, at random. So we have touched this probabilistic description by discussing a diffusion. So the, that's one aspect of the motion of those particles. But we know that if they, that they interact by the forces between themselves, and we know that if there are very few of those particles, like in a gas, they are so far away that the interaction between them can be described as a collisions. But if they are much denser, like in a liquid, then the details of that interaction is of some importance. And I have shown that interaction by that picture, cartoon, P-like picture of two particles with a spring between them. So we have the energy of a mutual interaction of those particles out of which a block of matter is built. Well, because they interact with each other, then eventually that interaction, or occasionally, that interaction may become so strong that those particles form a compound. They are having a bound state. They stick together. And that I have shown in here. And then if they are tied to each other by the intermolecular forces, then there is an energy stored there. And, and that energy can be liberated when this binding is broken. That is a chemical energy. This is a chemical energy which is so important in biological processes, namely for in which most of the energy in the human 
bodies in our tissues is uh, concentrated. But there is also the, another aspect of the energy, namely that if I have a molecule, that this molecule, which might consist of many, many atoms, for example, a molecule of a protein consists, and you, you might correct me, but I believe I'm not making a big mistake, the molecule, protein molecules might have millions of atoms in it, millions of particles in it. So if they have a million of the particles, they hardly are rigid objects. They can move. So there, are, there is an energy related to the vibration and conformal changes of those molecules, which is another uh, container of the energy in our piece of matter. Well, if there are atoms there, then we know nowadays that atoms consist of a nuclei and electron clouds around them, and that electron clouds around those nuclei are governed by the laws of a quantum mechanics. But we also know that this law allowed the electrons for, in this language of the 19th century, change their orbits, namely to fall from the higher energy state to the lower energy state, and then emit photons, emit the light, emit the radiation. And if they emit the radiation, then there is another part of an energy which comes out in our body, which is electromagnetic radiation. And I can shine in my material body electromagnetic radiation. So there I showed that the contribution of electromagnetic radiation by that part of a cartoon. So I have two parts of it which are related to the electromagnetic waves. And finally, I had to, I, we have to, we learned at the turn of the 19th and 20th century that the nuclei uh, disintegrate, that there is a phenomenon which is called radioactivity. We deserve it to the Maria Skodowska Kiri, her father, her husband, and the mentor, Henry Becquerel, that there is a radi radioactive decay. So the nuclei, nucleus, disintegrate, and when it disintegrates, it releases energy, and it releases energy in different, in three different kinds. It releases the kinetic energy in a form of a very heavy particles called alpha particles, which are nothing else than the nuclei. I'm terribly sorry, but I lost the connection. So we had this, uh, this box and we, the, the, the radioactive decay creates the particles which have which are nothing else than the than the that the nuclei of a helium four consisting of two neutrons and two protons but the other kind of energy emitted from the form of the energy which comes out from radioactive decay is a beta decay which is the kinetic energy of a very fast electrons ejected in the process of the disintegration. And finally, we have again electromagnetic radiation, very short wavelength waves, electromagnetic waves, which is usually called gamma rays. So that is basically what is, what kinds of energy are all inside of it. So when we have two pieces of matter, and when we connect it with the other matter, in the process which we discussed, discussing a zero law of thermodynamics, and if the energy is transformed from one to a piece of matter to another, the processes are extremely complicated. We hardly, we, we can of course try to do the microscopic calculation and go by, by one piece of type of energy to another and discuss what is happening, but that is not very, uh, a very fruitful procedure. And in addition, the energy can transform into each other within our body. The um, disintegrating radioactive nuclei had initially certain energy, and this energy 
which was a binding energy of a nucleus, is now released in the form of these three types of radiation I have tell you. So the energy can change. But the one property of that is that it cannot be lost and cannot be created in that process. So if I had my nucleus which disintegrate, it might produce the alpha particle or beta particle or gamma ray, but the energy is conserved. The end total energy cannot be changed. And therefore, if I had that just split in two pieces of energy, I have the combination of them. So the sum of all the energies within my body must be constant. And the sum of that energy is called internal energy, and the internal energy of the body is our is is usually denoted as a capital letter U. All right. So we know that we have that body, and now let's let's look up and remember that energy is conserved. So this is also the point when I have to make a comment that you might have heard that. Uh, this, there are people who are claiming that we should go on from the uh, that we should change our civilization in order to use a renewable energy. Well, that concept is completely without a sense, physical, because energy cannot be lost or renewed. It's conserved. And the only problem is that we have to understood properly what is meant by the conservation of the energy. So we have our body again, and let's see what is happening when we contact the body to another body, for example, when we apply an external force. Well, uh, Let's first study a simple example. We have a gas, a container with the gas. We have a piston on the one side of that, uh, of that container. And we can apply a force to the piston, the force F, and we shift the piston a little bit by a distance delta X. What we know from a physics is that that force applied to the piston results in the external internal pressure of the container and that this pressure is related to the force by the simply by the multiplying by the area of the piston but if the piston moves a certain distance delta x then this force does a work and the work is a force time a distance. So the work is a pressure area times delta x. But what is the A times delta x? This is nothing else than the change of the volume of the container. And therefore, the work done by our external force moving the piston is equal to a pressure times the change of the volume. Let's look at that formula carefully. Work is just how much energy we have added to the system. Pressure is the intensive quantity. It does not depend on the number of atoms or anything. It's the, and what is the volume? the volume is an extensive quantity. If our container with the piston will be six times larger, then the work will be six times larger, but not because a pressure has changed, that is, but because the volume has increased. So the work done by our force, the energy which we have pushed into our system, depends on the intensive quantity called pressure and the volume. 
And we know that the pressure and the volume are connected by the equation of state, which we were studying uh, some weeks ago. So we have now the, we can envisage that there must be a general rule that if we apply a force which connects within a given plethora of possible types of energy within our body to one of those particular kinds of energy, then we must find a corresponding pressure, intensive parameter, which controls that interaction. But in general, we always will have the situation like this, that the work done by external perturbation of a system will be something like this relation, pressure times change of volume. Of course, there will be different units of this quantity, they might be different quantities, but they always will have the same property that one of them will be independent of the size of the system, be intensive, and the other will be extensive quantity. And uh, we will be discussing that in a concept of the first law of thermodynamics in a greater detail next week. And then we will go on with the second law of thermodynamics. Uh, uh, thanks you all very much. And as usually, I will provide the recording to 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 to, to Dr. Chivet. Thank you.